We're going to be starting off. It's going to be Luca Marcato representing Italy in our first game today. I mean, that list of accomplishments starting in 2017 and a couple years later moving on to a top eight in Berlin at the European International Championships last year. I was there. He was playing fantastically throughout the course of the tournament. So definitely the kind of person you want to be looking for when you're trying to say, all right, well, we need to level up this series that, you know, we're 2-1 down. Luca, time for you to go in and level this up at 2-2 two to two so we can push on through the, the rest of these games. Yeah, definitely. And just being able to go ahead and have that 4-0 and o record as well throughout this tournament is hugely uh, positive for the Italian side. But uh, without any further ado, we're going to be seeing the representative of Sweden today, Hjalmar Lindt, uh, going ahead and getting that top eight in Malmo Regionals back in 2017, the same year that he did actually start off. So very strong start to his VGC career, of course, being able to go ahead and uh, get a two and two uh, neutral record for this tournament, of course, in the European Cup. But he's out to prove something right now that Sweden is not down and out. They are really going to try to go through the full mile and go ahead and try to get that three versus one advantage against Italy, which right now can really catch Italy uh, off guard and absolute shock. Yeah, it could it could change the flow of the match. Of course, we are going to get to look at their teams and see exactly what they're bringing. Uh, we'll be looking at this game from Luca's side. So his team uh, looking pretty interesting there. Some things that I don't think we've seen in, in a long time. Pokemon like Nian Shao that wow. featured probably for the last time in 2014. Uh, you know, we've seen a little bit of Hjalmar's team. Teams like this have been popping up already in this new series as it's kind of grown and throughout, you know, European Cup and the Players' Cup as well. So a number of interesting things. Uh, looks like a pretty clear and, and quick decision, though, uh, from from Luca as he, as he just dives right into team preview here. Yeah, and uh, from Hjalmar's side, we are going to be seeing the Lapras, Talonflame, Dracovish, and unfortunately, because Luca's just <laughs> checking out his team, which has uh, a lot of one type of move that I actually saw, which looks a bit scary, not going to lie. But um, on Hjalmar's side, we're going to be seeing the Lapras, Talonflame, Dracovish, Rillaboom, Toad Kiss, and that Urshifu. So we have that mode that we have actually been seeing more come out from the Italian side in the Lapras and Talonflame. You've got that very quick uh, Tailwind, uh, with the G Max Resonance Life Orb boosted Lapras uh, mode going on for him. He does have Dracovish, Rillaboom, Toadkiss, Urshifu. They're just overall really good uh, Pokemon, especially in this format. Rillaboom is mainly everywhere, has really good access to certain coverage type moves, which could might prove to be an issue onto that Magna Zone, depending on how Luca is going to try to tackle that situation. Well, there is an issue, and, and we saw Luca flash it, and that's the five allies switch Pokemon. I mean, yeah. it's a, a move that is so divisive, and, and people get really, really like heated about it. They, they find it so hard to play against. Some people call it right every time and, and don't care, but other people, if you start falling into this trap, it, it could be a huge problem. And I think in this matchup, the way that something like the Talonflame Lapras works, that we are going to get to view as the lead here from Hjalmar, uh, you know, you're setting up Tailwind, you're throwing out a big attack, and Gigantamax only a single target. So you've yeah. really got to be smart about where you're throwing that single target. And I think once Hjalmar realizes, hey, Ally Switch could be everywhere here, uh, he's going to have to be really smart and, and try and make some big calls in, in how to target things properly. Uh, it's it's going to be a running theme if, if Luca decides to start firing Ally Switches every turn and, and mm -hmm. just messing up the board. Yeah. Uh, it could be, could be an mm -hmm. issue. Yeah, definitely can be. I think it's like you said, it's all dependent on when uh, Luca decides to go ahead and use those moves and maybe try to go into those mind games because being able to have five Pokemon that have allies, which is absolutely huge. We do see him lead with the Clefairy and the Magnezone, whilst, of course, we saw that Talonflame and Lapras mode coming out from um, Hjalmar's side as well, But which he does look like he's going to go straight for the Dynamax right here. It is looking to be that Lapras, of course, which will be taking advantage of any potential Tailwinds that if the Talonflame so decides to go for, will be able to go ahead and outspeed everything else on the field. Um, uh, whilst Magna Zone, on its other hand, it could be opting to go for the Dynamax, which I think is more than likely going to be happening here right now. It does have the Clefairy support on its side. It will be able to redirect any moves, uh, if so it chooses to, as well as provide additional bulk through a uh, potential ability of the Friend Guard that it could be carrying. 
of course. And Madden's Zone is a huge threat right now, both to the Talonflame and the Lapras. Super effective Electro-type moves will be uh, very free for Luka to be going for, as we do see the Follow Me going out from the Clefairy right now, wanting that redirection to allow the Madden Zone to go ahead and do its business. Whilst we do see the Tail Wind coming out from the Talonflame, guaranteeing that the Lapras will be outspeeding, uh, outspeeding that Madden Zone 100% in a huge amounts of damage actually onto that Clefairy, which is mainly known to be quite bulky, especially if they do have that Aether Light item that they do uh, really uh, fashion most of the time. We do see the Life Orb recoil reveal on the Lapras and a Max Lightning being able to just ignore that Aurora Veil that was set up from the Lapras is going to be more than enough to pick up the KO onto the Talonflame as well as set that Electric Terrain. So looking to be a very solid start from Luca's side, of course, on Hjalmar's side, he does have the Aurora Veil and Tailwind going for him, but it just depends on the situation, doesn't it, Adam? It's a tough one, because that Talonflame Lapras lead worked exactly as intended. It set up Tailwind and it set up Aurora Veil. That's a great turn, but he didn't get a knockout. And that's something that I think Luca was able to capitalize on and just say, you know what, that's fine, set it up. I'm just going to deal enough damage to get through it. And that's something that's so easy to read when you see that from this, this Lapras and Talonflame lead, you know exactly what it's yeah. going to do. There's mm -hmm. no real surprise factor, to be honest with you. It, it, it's done the same thing as, as long as it's been around. And, you know, right now, this Magna Zone probably not feeling all that threatened. The Clefairy is still able to, to redirect moves or, or cause problems with Ally Switch. So uh, the Clefairy is able to keep it safe for at least this turn um, yeah. and potentially future turns as well. And then you can see, uh, you know, where you can go from there. It is something to be aware of as well that. If this Magnus Zone gets hit by something like a fighting attack, mm -hmm. it's just going to activate its weakness policy. And that weakness policy then means your Aurora Veil is, is pointless. So you've got to be so careful in the way you, you play around it. Um, mm -hmm. But I like this. I like Clefairy protecting and I like Clefairy uh, causing mind games early on. We'll see if uh, Hjalmar decides to, to fall for them. Oh, he doesn't, at least with the Earth Shoot. Oh, of course he does go through it. I forgot, of course, the Unseen Fist ability ignoring that Clefairy's Protect. Uh, going to show you that cool looking mechanic there being able to deal damage but not pick up the ko as the lapras will be going for that max geyser into the madden zone will be setting up the rain of course didn't deal as much damage as it would have liked but right now there's going to be huge amounts of damage coming out from this madden zone does target the lapras uh, that is through an aurora veil adam it is so so strong especially because it is boosted by that electric terrain yeah, I mean, he's got the terrain, he's getting hit as well, which helps with, uh, you know, boosting the damage. So, Clefairy's done a really good job there of, of just sticking around. And the fact that Clefairy hung on, you know, Wicked Blow isn't really going to get the knockout, right? You've you got to do a little more to, to try and knock out Clefairy. So, uh, causing some really good problems here. And I think what's going to be key and something that, that's really interesting to me is if this Magnet Zone can make it out of the Dynamax, I think it does mm -hmm. a lot better than many other Pokemon post Dynamax, right? We saw it when he was playing with it in turn one. It's actually got rising voltage and that's that's so huge in just being able to, to tear through and, and take knockouts. So this Clefairy has been buying a lot of time. If the Magma Zone has three turns of uninterrupted, unimpeded Dynamax, yeah. it's gonna be a really good position. Mm -hmm. And especially taking moves like Wicked Blow away, exactly what Clefairy needed to do. Oh, 100%. So this will allow the Madden Zone to go ahead and get a free, uh, get some free damage off as well into either of the Pokemon that it so chooses to go for. As we do see the Max Geyser now powered by the Rain actually Ooh. picking up a KO thanks Ooh. to that critical hit. That is absolutely huge right there. I'm not sure if that could, if uh, without a critical hit, that Lapras would have been able to pick it up. It doesn't look like it because being able to be boosted by the rain, by that life orb, and get an additional critical hit to further increase that damage output could actually be game winning right now. That critical hit was huge. That critical hit was so essential to knock out that Magna Zone. I think if the Magna Zone fires back in that turn, you're in a lot of trouble in, in yeah. uh, you know, Hjalmar's position. But he's picked up the knockout. He's forced, uh, you know, a really quick swing of momentum here. The the way that you've gone from being a Pokemon down to a Pokemon up in a turn is huge. And particularly when it's, you know, obviously a double knockout, you force your last two out, really, from your opponent. And that's that's always interesting to see and, and force them to, to bring in something and a pairing that maybe they wanted to kind of separate out a little bit. Yeah. Um, that said, Togekiss, me and Xiao, uh, an interesting pairing, not something we've actually seen uh, 
throughout this you know recent tournaments me and Xiao kind of sitting on the sidelines a little bit mm -hmm. uh, there's so many other good fighting types that i think i preferred with a little more bulk so be curious to see if me and Xiao can start to tidy this one up of course having the fighting type very very useful here and a lot of pressure on the togekiss to keep it safe so really tough decisions to be made from from Hyalma in this one uh, and see where where he can go uh, we're just going to go ahead and see that fake out from the Mian Chao into the Lapras, not allowing it to move, at least for this turn. Wicked Blow comes out uh, immediately after into the Toad, just deals huge amounts of damage onto a Pokemon that is not only bulky, it resists it, but in retaliation, it comes out with a Dazzling Gleam, picks up that KO onto the Lapras, and actually brings that Urshifu Central Strike down to its focus, Ash, allowing that one hit point to still be live and well. And... Uh, after, of course, the Lapras does go down, we see the third Pokemon, uh, or the last Pokemon, sorry, on uh, the field right now, uh, coming out for Hjalmar in the form of that Dracovish. Well, here's something that's interesting, and something that we touched on at the beginning of the game. Ally Switch has been revealed to us, but mm -hmm. Hjalmar may not know about it. And right now, you know, he's got the spread move in Dazzling Gleam. The spread move is going to be perfect here. And oh. this is such a key turn. He reveals Ally Switch on Mian Shao. If the targeting's off here by even a, a fraction, I mean, th th this is a problem, right? Yeah. The, the targeting is off, and, and this game really comes down exactly to Togekiss. I think sacrificing the Mian Shao perfect here, Togekiss is going to take close combat, and I think we know what's coming to wrap this up. Oh yeah, Dazzling Gleam will be coming out right now to try to pick up that KO onto the Dracovish. Will it be able to? It won't actually for the Toad Kiss. Um, it actually took that quite well, the Dracovish. Of course, it was able to pick up the KO onto the Urshifu, but we did see the Aurora Veil uh, allowing it to be <laughs> able to survive. It does get worn off right now, and this is looking like the Dracovish might be able to pick up the win. Yeah, I mean, I was... I wasn't quite sure if it was going to be able to, to take that but then i forgot all, all about the aurora veil so the aurora veil actually causing the problem i think that last turn play was really key from luca yeah. and it was a really really it was the like the, the optimal play right but mm -hmm. not having a better way to knock out the drake at the end there is a problem and something he has to be a little more considerate of so while i think luca did everything he could to get back in the game and now he's made something kind of interesting in that he's now forcing mind games from mm -hmm. kyalmar it's it's going to be a tough one for sure to to swing it back um and, but i i think the mind game of ally switch is is gonna be huge for him yeah i mean it also depends on if that toad kiss right if it was um able to be if it was a scope lens for example um uh a set which did have that super luck ability it could have perhaps been able to pick up a ko if it critical hit through that dracovish so i think that would have been crucial maybe it had like a huge it had a high chance of getting that crit it wasn't able to do so but like you said adam uh being able to have that ally switch reveal automatically adds mind games into the set this is now gonna be it's it's kind of one of those moves right that lasts throughout the set now that you know that it's been revealed you're constantly having to have that thought nibble at the back of your mind thinking is he gonna go for it is he not well he's only revealed it on one pokemon too he revealed it on the end Chow and, exactly and, yeah. you know a lot of people probably know clefairy has access to it but i don't know if as many people would be expecting it on some of the other choices as well so it could be curious to see if if luca leans into that as mm -hmm. a solution to, to try and kind of deal with this this offense that uh, we saw from from Kyalmar's side so I think Kyalmar saving the Dracovish was huge and you've got to be very respectful of that and understanding of, of having a potential win condition to tidy it up True. Uh, but in the long run you know I think Luke showed a lot of what his team wants to do he was just mm -hmm. kind of uh, one turn too early right he needed the Aurora Veil to go he probably need to land the crit as you mentioned and maybe get rid of that that tailwind a little bit earlier not get rid of but kind of work through that tailwind a little bit better so i imagine he's got the tools and he's got a lot of information on how he wants to strike back i think his lead was was perfect um but hjalmar kind of just took a took a team that we've been seeing for a little while now and and executed it flawlessly and there's a lot of credit to that a lot of people say you know you can't take something off the shelf and, and win with it which hjalmar got game one through just executing that strategy absolutely flawlessly and, and doesn't look like he's gonna deviate from it right now yeah, since it did work out for him quite well, but we're actually going to be seeing a, uh, the exact same leads that did come out in game one from both of these trainers, the Clefairy and Magnezone, on Luca's side. Uh, it will be able to provide uh, that additional bulk, of course, onto the Magnezone and allow it to go ahead and just uh, start dishing out huge amounts of damage. 
Well, there's a targeting change here, which I think is interesting, and that's the way that the Max Lightning is going, which I think is probably going to be quite helpful for him in the long run. Um, mm. Obviously, he doesn't want to get crit on that Magna Zone again either, which was a big issue in, in game number one. So yeah, a lot of decisions to be made here, uh, a lot of things to, to think about. But, you know, the, the Magna Zone into Lapras matchup is great. you just got to watch out for, for some of the partners that can deal with your Magna Zone. But if you know that the Talon Flame is going to spend a turn tailwinding, why worry about it this turn? Like, you can get it next turn, right? Like, it, it's, not, it's not going anywhere. It's damage output underwhelming in the, in the future. Yeah. And we are just going to go ahead and see that Dynamax. It will more than likely be that Lapras, which we do, of course, get confirmation from right now. The Gigantamax Lapras will be wanting to go ahead and get that Aurora Veil up and going, whilst, of course, dealing huge amounts of damage. It is in that situation that, of course, it can. And uh, this is literally the exact same turns as we saw from game one, at least with regards to the Dynamax uh, choice as well. The Magazine going ahead, wanting to get that Dynamax going, like you said, Adam, it all depends on which Pokemon it chooses to go ahead and target down this turn round. And um, if there's just going to be a safe follow me right now, or perhaps a protect. Ooh, but we do actually see the protect um, that come out right now, not wanting to deal with any sort of damage. The Tailwind, of course, once again, wanting to go ahead and establish the speed control over on Kalmar's side, at least for his ally Pokemon in the back. We do see G-Max Resonance goes into that Clefairy, but this turn round, it doesn't actually deal as much of damage that it really would have liked, and is a bit reminiscent of Game 1. It will be able to go ahead and get that Aurora Veil up and going. Uh, maybe that was the choice. Right now, it doesn't want to accept huge amounts of damage, if not maybe a KO from the Magna Zone, which we see in that Max Lightning this time round, targeting that Lapras, uh, realizing that that Talonflame is sitting a bit too... Uh, it's done its job, right, Adam? But right now, like you said, it doesn't threaten as much with regards to the damage. Well, I like what, what we're seeing from Luca's side here, right? Where he's playing the game differently because he he has access to, to kind of information about how Hyalma plays, and he has access to the thought of what Hyalma's going to do, right? He just protected this yeah. turn with his Clefairy. So if you think the Follow Me is coming, you've got to throw attacks that, that respond well to Follow Me, and that's something I think he's leaning into with this decision he's made right now, to sing instead of, uh, you know, try and, and fire back and just keep going on this Lapras. I mean, he's got the Electric Terrain up now, that's going to be a huge buff to his damage, and that should be enough to make sure he gets the knockout when he hits the Lapras. Uh, yeah. But I think what he's banking on here is is the Talonflame targeting the Clefairy, assuming follow me, and that giving him a, you know a little bit more time with with that uh, Magma Zone on the field. And the Clefairy, yeah, gets exactly what it wanted done, it, and it didn't get knocked out, didn't waste to follow me, and might be able to fire back with a sing. Ooh, and it does, and it Ooh. avoids. That was close. Um, the Talonflame being able to dodge that scene. Um, but like you said, Adam, I think uh the lapras max guard there was hugely key it was an anticipation of a max lightning the brave bird like you said did go into the clefairy didn't even try to go for the flare blitz so that could also uh prove to be quite big but of course if the madden zone does have that weakness policy it doesn't want to be able to proc it so it deals even more damage right and i i like what we're seeing here from from both players um, I'd be curious. I actually missed exactly what the Clefairy was going for this turn. This Clefairy could make this this third turn Magna Zone or third turn of Dynamax uh, really impactful because as long as the Magna Zone's safe, it's then going to be uh, really kind of important. And, and honestly, with this switch, I think this Magna Zone is going to be uh, in a in a really good position. So a sing last turn, um, you know, if that fires off again, obviously the Electric Terrain's in play and it's not going to work. Uh, oh no, the grassy train's in play. That's actually that that could be crucial. My apologies. No, definitely. As Rillaboom did come onto the field, and we saw Clefairy go for that protect. Max Geyser in turn comes out from that Lapras. Will be trying to pick off that uh, cute little fairy in the form of that Clefairy, but not being able to. Uh, thanks to that very clutch protect right there, it will be setting up the rain as well, so it can further increase its damage output. But will it be allowed to do so in the following turn? I don't think so. Definitely not, given the fact that that Magazine was able to still pick up the KO even if the electric terrain wasn't on the field which right now it is reset back to it from that grassy terrain so being able to go ahead and pick up that very vital ko uh on lucas uh, side of the field 
can prove to be quite detrimental and momentum uh, swinging for him. That is a huge turn for Luca. to be honest. There's so many things go right for him in that turn. So first of all, uh, Hjalmar just keeps buying into this idea that Clefairy's going to follow me again and is throwing attacks at it. And he's taking advantage of that, right? He's throwing out these constant protects or, or sings that he's getting away with. And that is Hjalmar kind of taking the bait turn on turn on turn and, and just not getting enough value out of it. I mean, the Clefairy's still in play. On top of that, he's real smart about the terrain. So it's curious that Hjalmar switches in uh, Rillaboom. I understand why, because you take away electric terrain and uh, then you're able to maybe keep your Lapras around. But curiously, if you look at the damage from turn number one, with the Life Orb recoil and the damage, it bought him under half. So yeah. I'm not sure if I agree that that was <laughs> necessary. And now electric terrain's still in play. Uh, that means you can't mm -hmm. grassy glide with priority. Um, <clears throat> You're kind of stuck just doing it in normal time. And this Magnazone's Rising Voltage that we're seeing in this turn is going to do a huge amount of damage. Nearly actually picking up the KO as well on that Dracovish. So huge amounts of damage, like you said. Uh, right now, the Electric Terrain is still on the field. Clefairy does go down. But of course, Luca will be able to have a fresh Pokemon to bring in straight off of the bench right now. Um, what do you think right now with regards to who has the advantage, who doesn't? Uh, honestly, I believe Luca to have the advantage. I think it's a yeah. it's a tough one um, because obviously we're very very close in the Pokemon count, mm -hmm. but the control of the terrain is huge, and the Rillaboom not being able to Grassy Glide is is a problem, right? You, and yeah. With that in mind, you need to start switching stuff to to get back Grassy terrain. And if you're switching stuff, and you know, Luca already knows that it's the Talon Flame in the back. He can play to that, and he can. He can play with that in mind. I really don't see this Magnazone being threatened either right now. So it feels to me like Luke is in the driving seat. He's now got a fake out user extra as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, he can he can do a lot with that. It's curious to see the Rillaboom over the Airshifu actually from, from game number one. I, I'm not quite sure why he felt that switch was needed. I think obviously Airshifu's damage was underwhelming, but it was still important in the long run. Uh, so there's a switch, not where I was quite expecting it, but this Ooh. Drake Wish is not in, not in peak like location to, to deal with that fake out yeah so um look up uh Hjalmar being able to recognize that he goes for the grassy glide into the Miancha, actually being able to pick up the ko just going to show how frail that Miancha is and how powerful that rillaboom is whilst rising voltage of course will be able to definitely pick up the ko onto that uh, talon flame um doesn't even need the electric terrain from that range as the aurora veil does now wear off on Hjalmar's side he will be bringing back that Dracovish against this Magnazone and the last Pokemon on Luka's side, which is going to be that Togekiss. So, like you said, not being able to have the terrain control is a huge uh, thing in this certain matchup, isn't it? Yeah, it's a huge loss, and, and that means... I mean, Grassy Glide isn't really effective against either of them here, so you want that little extra, though, and that healing as well. Like it, It's all going to add up and be so important. Um, that said, Luca has a very, very funny play that he can he can look for in this turn, and it looks like he's locking it in. Um, he's mulling it over, but uh, we saw him go all the way down to the bottom there. <laughs> Obviously, we saw the Togekiss and Bien Shaolo switch last turn yeah. at the end of last game. My apologies. Um, and so, it, you know, it it's in that same position, right? It's keep Togekiss safe this turn so Togekiss can knock out the Dracovish. Aurora Rail's gone and Dracovish has already taken damage, so no real worries about it there. Um, he is going to run his timer all the way down and actually take us all the way to, um, you know, the, the kind of bottom of the timer. Uh, Magnazone, though, ooh, does get knocked ooh. out, so it's a good job he didn't ally switch on that, that turn. Yeah, definitely. So the Fisher's Ren being able to pick it off as Dazzling Gleam in turn will be able to pick off that KO onto the Draco Vish whilst dealing a bit more damage onto this Rillaboom. And this Rillaboom going for Grassy Glide, highly suggesting this might be a potential choice band Rillaboom over on Hjalmar's side. Um, this might actually end up being quite close. Togekiss does have the type advantage, but then again, we don't know how it might end up. We do see the air slash coming out, and it actually goes ahead and picks up the straight KO, Adam, thanks to a critical hit as well, just to be sure, giving Luca game two right there and pushing the set into a third game. So that last turn where the Fisher Shren goes toward the Magma Zone is, is kind of interesting, right? And it's something that the mind game of a potential ally switch gets into. You think, all right, well, if he's ally switching all the time and he's, he's doing ally switch partners, you know, yeah. if you know Magma Zone can, can learn that or, you know, and Togekiss can learn that too, then you think, 
okay, well, I gotta go where I think the Togekiss is gonna be. Because Togekiss, at that point, if you're in Hjalmar's shoes, was, was very clearly the win condition for Luka, right? It has access to knock out the, the Rillaboom, it has an easy way to knock out the Dracovish. So, he kind of, I think, takes the bait there. He was taking the bait through a lot of that game, where he was falling for exactly what, uh, you know, he Luca wanted him to do. He was attacking mm -hmm. into protects or the wrong side at the end. And, and this team has really kind of messed with with Yalmar in game two. So it's up to him to bounce back in game three if he wants to push Sweden all the way to that three one advantage that we talked about before. Uh, he needs to bounce back. He's got to kind of figure this out quickly and and not let those decisions that went wrong for him in game number two affect him in game number three and against the team like like Lucas. That's just so hard to do. Oh, it definitely is, because as a trainer, and when you're in this high-pressure situation where you know that every single win matters, especially in a grand final for the European Cup, um, being thrown off of your balance, or should I say your instinctive balance, is a very crucial thing that, um, as a player, you experience and you have to uh, gain even more experience about it so you can have better control over it. So it's all going to be uh, coming down to if Hjalmar is going to be able to reset uh his uh balance with regards to his mindset so being able to say listen i'm just gonna think a bit more clear right now i know i'm aware of what he has but i'm also aware of what the board position is so i have to play to my outs and this is something that i find interesting about about Kiyama's team is he doesn't really have like many spread attack options to try and just deal with ally switch right like that's one thing that True. a lot of people talk about like oh how do you deal with ally switch with your spread attack and you can't avoid it and he really doesn't have as many of those options. I do like this mix-up from Luca's leads. I think the Porygon, to, uh, Porygon Z, my apologies, uh, is, is kind of doing a similar thing to the the Magna Zone, but it knows it can get away with it, right? And it can get away with it really easy if that Urshifu is not present as well. So seeing that Urshifu didn't make it into the game two squad for Hjalmar maybe frees him up to, to play around that, that Porygon Z a little bit more. Yes, we're going to see Luca go ahead and go for the Dynamax, which this time around will be moving first because, of course, it is the Porygon Z, uh, showing that it is definitely faster than this Lapras, at least for now, um, before a potential Tailwind comes out from the Talonflame. But then again, the Porygon Z is just able to exert so much damage output right now, as well as being able to go ahead and, if it attacks with Max Strikes, be able to start reducing the speed over on Hjalmar's side, as we do see him go ahead, and once again, for the third time in a row, we see that Gigantamax Lapras uh, taking that huge form right now, uh, being able to go ahead and maybe get a Aurora Veil up and going. It seems to be a solid strategy right now, but it all is situation. We don't actually see a follow me coming out from the Clefairy, but we do see that ta uh, Tailwind coming out from the Talonflame, and in turn, the G-Max Resonance does come off, goes into that Porygon Z slot, First, of course, is going to be able to deal good amounts of damage as well as get that Aurora Veil up and going for Hjalmar's side. Um, now it's all about how much damage is this Porygon Z going to be able to do. It does go for that max strike and it does target the Lapras, wanting to get rid of it, not being able to deal as much of damage. Just going to show that Aurora Veil really paying dividends right there um, and being so crucial in this game plan from Hjalmar. But we see the raw sing actually come out and land onto this Lapras, being able to actually potentially neuter it for the next two Dynamax turns remaining for it. I like this adaptation a lot from Luca here. Uh, you know, Sing's been revealed. There's no secret to it. And obviously, people aren't so inclined to press that button with without kind of a backup plan. Uh, but this is just a good, good answer to it, is put stuff to sleep and... Hey, you know, once it's asleep, you can just wail on it with max strikes for a couple of turns, lower the speeds as well, make sure that tailwind's really, really pointless. And you can see this this is a very defensive play from Kyama because he's that scared of the thing. His Dynamax has gone to sleep and he's like, I don't want it. I don't want the rest of my team to go to sleep. <laughs> so his Lapras is gonna just keep getting wailed on. Now, two speed drops make that tailwind absolutely useless for the Lapras. Yep. It definitely does, and it does go ahead and deal even more damage than John Twit, as the Lapras will be going ahead and taking another turn of sleep, and we see that uh, Clefairy trying to go and be pesky and go ahead and put that Talonflame to sleep as well, but being met with that Protect from the Talonflame, being aware, like you said, Adam, it's just in this situation, I don't think Hjalmar's really liking the fact that that Sin came out and was able to basically stop this Lapras's moves uh, going and being actual... Uh, meaningful for his situation. 
this Lapras is uh, kind of missing out on something key as well. If it doesn't get to attack this turn, which it doesn't look likely it's going to be afforded the opportunity to, mm. it's not going to be able to set up the rain. And that rain has been kind of very key for the, the late game win condition Kyama has, which is around that Dracovich. So mm. uh, it doesn't look like he's going to be free to, to set it up. I mean, uh, this Max Strikes follows up and knocks it out. And now the Ficious Wren's later down the line are a lot more like manageable. Uh, yeah. At that time, so that sing in turn one has been absolutely huge. Uh, you know, the speed dropping really doesn't matter at this point. Like, things are just getting slower and slower, mm -hmm. and obviously the the Talonflame lost its ability by taking damage. Uh, getting some damage done on Porygon two was great, uh, but this Talonflame going back oh. to sleep. Hey, it's super slow and asleep now. It's very manageable. Oh wow, and that's a guaranteed sleep turn as well because we did see the Talonflame go ahead and move before the Clefairy, meaning that it is definitely guaranteed to be asleep the next time it tries to move. So being able to go ahead and land two raw sins in a row, should I say, of course we saw the Protect coming out on the, uh, from the Talonflame the previous turn, is absolutely huge. It just really uh, stops Kyalmo's strategy right in the tracks he's uh, able to go ahead and bring that rillaboom of course the aurora veil is still in play for Hyomo's side but being able to just go ahead and shut down your opponent's strategies with a sleep status condition like that is absolutely huge right now and also i mean being able to to ignore the talent flame is great you can assume it's going to be the drake commission in the back so you can kind mm. of play around that information as well um I, I like this. I like this a lot. Um, I think the one thing that kind of Hyama has going for him in this turn is that Rillaboom has grassy terrain and no way for that to be changed. So yeah. based on what we saw in game two, the choice band version is, is going to be able to start tidying stuff up with grassy glide and uh, a lot of decision making being done by Luca here to, to make sure that, uh, you know, his Porygon 2 is, uh, Porygon Z, my apologies, is able to, to fire off the, the moves that it needs. Ooh, and that Woodhammer is going to be able to pick up the straight solid one-hit KO from that uh, potentially choice banded Rillaboom in the grass terrain onto that Clefairy. Talonflame takes its guaranteed turn of sleep, and the Thunderbolt actually comes out from the Porygon Z, will be enough to pick up the KO onto that Talonflame, actually opting to ignore the Rillaboom. It had the opportunity to maybe go for a Hyper Beam to pick up the KO, but it didn't opt to do so. I'm not sure if that was the best play, but then it all depends on what both Luca and Hjalmar have in the back. And with the Togekiss revealed in the back, I, I think that's his kind of condition to deal with, with Rillaboom, right? And it just got really good for Togekiss. Togekiss is seeing those two Pokemon that it defeated at the end of game number two and was able to deal with handily. So this is a really good position. Uh, I think what's interesting here is, is as we've discussed, he has Allo Switch available and, and Hjalmar's going to be real careful on, on where he throws things because, Ooh. you know, if you kind of mess that up, if uh, mainly the Ficious Rend, right? If you mess up the Ficious Rend, that goes in the wrong slot, and that takes out the Porygon, that's fine. But this Wood Hammer isn't going to affect Togekiss. Like, Togekiss mm. is going to be able to take a Wood Hammer, and then you're going to give yourself recoil damage and put yourself, like, way closer. So Togekiss is actually mixing it up a little bit. I kind of like that. Um, but certainly a tough one. I mean, no rain either for the Ficious Rend, uh, which has been kind of a staple of the past two games, is is a tough one so togekiss is the one uh, drawing attention to itself it, it got the the glory in, in game number two uh, and dracovich forced Ooh. into a rock slide of all things oh a rock slide but it actually misses on the porygon z so that looked like it would have been the safer play for hjalmar uh, hjalmar but not in this situation we see the disastrous uh hugely powerful hyper beam coming out being able to pick up the straight KO onto that Rillaboom, that Rock Slide would have stopped it from being able to do that and given Kyomo more of a fighting uh, chance right now, but it's really not looking good be seeing that Dracovish versus three of Lucas Pokemon. Yeah, I mean, I understand why the Dracovish is, is committed to the Rock Slide here. It's going to be the choice oh. scarf variety. I, I get it. You have to open up your win conditions. But seeing the lack of damage, not having the rain, so you can fish us random and such, is, is a is a problem. And now with no more Aurora Veil, and a critical hit. And a critical there's, hit. Uh, there's the Dazzling Gleam knockout on Dracovic. Oh. So really kind of smart play from Luca to bounce back from losing game one in, in kind of grueling fashion. Uh, well played by Kyama throughout the whole set. But overall, uh, that, that combination available to him was, was just too much.
It was too much. That's very impressive, uh, being able to bring back the game like Luca did. Um, of course, there was a bit of RNG that was uh, played out at the end of the game uh, there of Game 3, but I felt like in the situation that the Rillaboom was in, at least, it did have Woodhammer. It was still in the grass terrain, of course. If it was that choice ban, it does, of course, threaten huge amounts of damage. But um, being able to just not take care of that Togekiss straight off the bat, like you said, not going for the Ficious Rend is absolutely huge and key. Because the Magic Zone, if we saw, of course, during the switches on Luka's side, was in the back. So it would have been able to have really uh, high defense uh, stat, of course, against that Rillaboom, which it will be resisting its attack. So it will be in a situation where it might be able to be just, you know, be able to just win that game out for Luka either way. Yeah, I, I think Hjalmar's strategy overall was, was kind of high risk, high reward, right? And particularly mm. the one he used in game two and three. So uh, he's got this really solid lead, this established tunnel flame, Lapras lead that we know is yeah. Tailwind So that resonance and go from there but then bringing two pokemon with choice items in the back is is so good if you're in the lead right like if you're or you know you've got them down to the last two and you know what you're targeting it's great um but luca kind of has a couple answers to that number one was being ahead and being kind of a step further forward because of the way he played around his clefairy and stuff and number two like having ally switch and, and making you second guess and question that was was really tough so i think luca actually got better as the set went on or is, is definitely his play went better and it just kept moving further in his favor i think after game two uh, it would have taken a lot for helmar to come back but it, it wasn't able to do it i think game one is like the perfect example of how that team works uh, mm -hmm. but games two and three was was really a, a good showing from luca Oh, 100 percent because he was able to kind of like find his way through that strategy and kind of break it and dismantle it should i say down so props to luca and of course the hjalmar very well played and set of course coming up from both of those trainers this will be getting italy back up to 2-2 two, two versus Sweden. So trust me, the action is still uh, in front of us right now, and it's going to be really hype. This is such a close match and set, of course, between both of these teams. I am incredibly hyped, and it's just going to be insane. Honestly,